Welcome into another edition of the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you as we hit on a, a handful of questions that were, were tossed in by some of the loyal subscribers to KSO because, uh, look, I thought we were gonna, I was going to get to this on Sunday. There was no Sunday show. And then I think, like everybody else, I looked at I was like, man, do we really want to like dive into basketball right now? And that was before the Texas game even happened. But there are some non-basketball-related things here and really some things that I think are probably pretty positive and pretty exciting. So let's let's get into them and, and just see how uh, D.Y. responds here. The first question that was tossed out there is in regards to Avery Johnson, because why wouldn't it be? But how impactful will the Avery Johnson effect essentially be? Meaning, I think the official question was, how many games does K-State win in 2024 that maybe they shouldn't but because of Avery Johnson's talent it takes them over the top and they're able to kind of steal some wins yeah I think I don't know if that happens as much in year two maybe year three I know that's probably not the answer that the uh, intended (laughs) answer that the the asker wanted but I think I think you might see a little bit of that in year two, but you're going to have some growing pains thrown in and it'll probably equal itself out a little bit. Um, you're kind of breaking in a little bit of a new offensive line, and so to speak. Uh, the defensive depth might not necessarily be there just yet. You know, a lot of games on the schedule are winnable. Avery Johnson does have that in factor. Uh, I don't know if it really pops at a significant level in 24 but especially more so in 2025. I think that's kind of where I fall is the schedule next year doesn't necessarily lend itself to, hey, this this game, you know, you're going to need something special for him. Like you need Avery Johnson to be special next season for K-State. But like we talked about when we broke down the schedule and any other time we've talked about it, it's a pretty nice schedule for K-State. Like some tricky road games, maybe the, the way it breaks down, but you only have a handful of games where, you might have real concern. The others, K-State, would likely be a significant favorite in. So uh, it'll be interesting to kind of see moving forward how that plays out. But I I think that there will be a couple of games where, you know, things are tough, but Avery Johnson is going to make a wow play. He's going to do it more, no doubt, in 2025. But when you have that kind of talent, you'll get those flashes at various points, and I think you'll get them some in 2024, but certainly not to the level of which, you know, you're getting it constantly and and just how special he could be by the time he gets a full year under his belt. Kind of in the same vein as everything in terms of the impact of Avery Johnson and kind of thinking of X factors for this football team next season, which transfer are you most excited to see hit the field in 2024 for K-State? Because they kind of got uh, guys from different levels uh, all throughout the board, and that can mean a couple of things, either the level that they came from playing from or – the position level that they're at on the field. I think the obvious one for a lot of people would be Dante Cephas, but after you know Keegan Johnson was pretty slow to start last year, you may be a little bit shaky on wide receiver transfers. So uh, I'll just I'll let you dive into which one you're most excited for. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, you could go really any of the four ways. I've spoken to all four transfers now after immediate availability. Dante Cephas is pretty important in terms of how you're going to make this passing game pretty dynamic uh, and helping Avery Johnson along, maybe being, you know, you got to have playmakers, and he's certainly someone that can be that from, from what we saw at his time at Kent State, if you could translate that to Manhattan a little bit better than he did Happy Valley. Travis Bates is someone with a really, really high ceiling, uh, really started to take off at a lower level, obviously, and uh, was wanted by, you know, several Power 5 programs, some, you know, the among the best in college football. And talking to him, it's just like that guy just was like a ball of energy. Um, really happy with where he's at. A guy is where his feet are. It's going to, you know, you've, you've heard that saying before, but he couldn't be more grateful. And he was just, you know, I'll do anything. You know, ask me. It just looked like this guy was just going to be an energizer bunny on the defensive line for K-State. Um, and so I really liked what I heard. Easton Kilty, uh, we just spoke about having to, so to speak, rebuild that offensive line to an extent. You do have some guys coming back, but Easton Kilty will be a pretty important piece for that. 
Uh, does he start at left tackle? Is he is he might be the guy you know protecting Avery Johnson's blind side? That's a pretty significant job uh, for the next year. And then, to be honest, one of the best interviews I had because this guy's just you could tell that he is a grown man, an adult that knows what he's doing. Um, nothing's going to be too big for him, um, and probably knows exactly how to work and how much needs to be put in and how much you got to dedicate yourself to be successful at this next level. And that was the safety Jordan Riley. I, I couldn't have been more impressed from him talking to him in that interview, a uh, very large human being for safety as well. So, you know, it's hard to pick one to be quite honest, because I was thoroughly impressed with all four. Quite frankly, I'm probably more torn between East and Kilty just because of what his job is going to be in the position that he plays and Jordan Riley, just because, you know, after speaking to him, like maybe the safety group's going to be just fine without Kobe Savage. I think I think Easton Kilty is probably the most important of the four transfers just because there there seems to be good talent there. He was a four star in the transfer portal. And you, like you said, you need him. Like this is a, a, a fairly new offensive line breaking in. He's got experience, he's got talent. He's going to be in charge of protecting every Johnson. But I think the guy that probably history would suggest he is going to be the most exciting and the most impactful, I think I think it's your guy, Jordan Riley, because think about how many transfer DBs have come to K-State since Chris Kleiman got here and made immediate impacts and not just been like, oh, he serves a good role, but like legitimately big-time helper for K-State. So I think Jordan Riley is probably the safe bet in terms of uh, the excitement level he brings. Yeah, good point on, on the the defensive back pedigree there in Manhattan under Chris Kleiman when you talk about you know Julius Brents, Josh Hayes, Russ Yeast, Echo Boydo, probably even forgetting someone. Um, they've been setting studs to the NFL. They absolutely have been. All right, moving on now, a little bit of basketball flair for you. And these are a couple of pointed questions, more about the overarching season and, and what comes before and after it. But has the has the five out offense backfired this year? Was this the right time to try it? And there's a lot of different ways that this thing can go because there was the recruiting element of it where it was not so quietly that they were doing this to try and attract Pat and Gongba. But also there's the fact that they thought they were going to have Naquan Tomlin on this team. And if you have Naquan Tomlin on this team combined with, you know, David Gasson is not some kind of mass shooter. That's bad phrasing. That's that's bad phrasing on my part. But he's not like he's not going to pour it in out there. He's not going to take you know a lot of big big shots. But he showed the willingness to take them earlier in the year. And I think this staff thought that he was going to be a little bit more improved from three than what he has proven to be. So you had kind of the horses early on there. But when you take Naquan Tomlin out and you realize that Gasson hasn't progressed the way you wanted to, and then you had to go get Will McNair, who is a traditional big you kind of run out of your options for what this team can do with it. And so it, it absolutely has backfired on them this year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would say almost to, uh, one, I don't know if there's ever a good time to institute something brand new, right? You're always going to sputter at least a little bit. They didn't expect it to be to this extent Two, it doesn't look this bad without Naquan Tomlin, right? And, and or maybe even Quest Glover, if you're going to try something new, uh, having it with forced into it with a six, seven man rotation and just 11 scholarship players and two of your top seven or eight gone is uh, never going to be a good time to, to institute it. So a uh, uh, perfect storm made it backfire is what I will say, but there's never a good time to start something new because you're always, it's what I said with Avery Johnson, like you're, you're there's going to be pains. Now the pains this year have been more significant than they were hopefully anticipating. I realized that. At the same time, it's not like, all well, the five-out offense sucks, doesn't work, we shouldn't have never done it. Um, yes, they did it with the idea of recruiting Patrick and Kong, but they did it with the idea of recruiting guys in general. Um, you run an offense like that that is conducive to what they want to run, it's wide open, <laughs> um, it's a lot of freedom. That's what players want to do, and that's what you do. In the, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's still a recruiting tool, whether it works or it doesn't. Um, obviously you want to see proof of concept look a little bit better uh, uh, at the end of the day. To call it backfired is probably accurate, um, but it's not like it was a horrible decision to do. Yeah, probably if you're looking at it, it, 
it's not bad long term to go to this because I do think long term it's actually a good thing. That this is the way basketball is going, but you have to be able to recruit the guys. And when you think about how flimsy the structure of this roster was, even even when Naquan Tomlin was still on it, like Naquan, there were issues that had come up for Naquan Tomlin because he was already dealing with some stuff prior to the stuff that actually eventually got him booted off the team. So you kind of knew that this was a, a weak roster. You didn't have the depth to run this. It's going to be imperative moving forward that they recruit the guys that can make this thing happen and make it work. But if they are able to do that, I, I don't hate it at all. And I think we've seen throughout the season they haven't been as married to it, but that also means you can't go to other things because what did you spend all offseason working on? It was this offense that now is basically obsolete for the talent that you have. Yeah, well, you could run. I mean, most I mean, and most of the time last year they just ran sets, so um, didn't really have necessarily anything like that. Still, a lot of freedom with the ball. I, I would just say I, and, I, and I'll I'll be generic because I don't want to like specifically like just trash any one or two players, but it's a personnel problem more than a system problem. Like, yeah, did a five out offense backfire? Technically, everything backfired, right? You're five and eight in the league. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, I think it's less of the system and more of who you have on the floor. Um, sometimes you're not good enough. Sometimes, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it doesn't shake out. Sometimes you get it wrong. I mean, Miami, what they've done year in and year out under Jim Laranega, an Elite Eight, a Final Four, it's not taking this year for some reason, and they're not good. Arkansas. Elite eight after elite eight after Eric Musselman, he's considered a recruiting savant for some reason. It's not taking this year for Arkansas, and they're terrible. Mizzou had a really splash of a first season under Dennis Gates, right? Kind of like the Jerome Tang thing, um, but not near the results. This year, they can't win an SEC game. Um, they can't even win a conference game. Sometimes it doesn't take. Sometimes things are out of your control. For some reason, it doesn't work. For those teams, it's probably – that they didn't recruit good fits or um, there's something going on in the locker room. Uh, you, you, there, you could be one of a number of things. It could be that for Kansas state too, but for Kansas state, it's really, well, you, you're down two guys that you thought were going to help you. So you're playing with only 11 scholarship players anyway. Right. Um, so it, it doesn't look great. It could look better, but it's more players than system. Um yeah, give me a different system that you think would work with this. I mean, like there's not – like that's why I come back to. It's like I don't think it's a system. I think it's who you got because I don't know if there's a good one. Like there's not an offense you're going to pick right now. It's like we could – even if you got one month to institute it, incorporate it, build it in, there, you're, this team's not going to all of a sudden become successful. It's it's the guys on the floor got to get better. And if they don't, if they already hit their ceiling – then this is what it is, and you got to restart next year. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I, it, it, it it's it's absolutely true, and I, I think Jerome Tang's system overall. I think the fact that this team has already won as many games as they've had and played as well as they have, and I know that sounds weird considering how things have gone, but I think it's a testament to him and his system. Uh, moving on, this is kind of similar to the five out and ties into it. How will the roster need to be reconfigured for next season for K-State basketball? Is it is it a reset, like a hard reboot, or are there just going to be some minor tweaks and we see a lot of these same guys back next season? It's something in between. I, I think you have to bring some back because you see some of these teams, and I know I can't say how to do it, and they did it to great success last year, but Jerome Tang was a culture guy, boom. You, you have to have someone there who says, this is how things are supposed to work. This is what we're supposed to do. If you don't have those examples, then you, you do have to restart and you do <laughs> can run into some issues. Like if Kansas State didn't have Marquise Noel or Keontae Johnson, two All-Americans, two NBA players, then last year's hard reset is a little bit more, much more difficult than what it looked to be. So at the end of the day, it's about having dudes. Last year you had dudes. This year you didn't. But if they didn't have dudes last year, that hard reset would have been troubling probably. You've seen a lot of these teams. Like Arkansas had a hard reset this year. Maybe why it's a little bit of a troubling situation that they're in right now. I think you have to do it a little bit of a mix. I think you got to have some retention. 
and that's why player development still is a thing. And then you have to have the NIL to retain to retain them, right? And then you have to go out and get a high school guy here or there in each class, and and then go do the transfer portal to try to get some you know firepower experience, whatever it may be. Now, here's the thing: you're going. To, it's minor tweaks is probably not going to be an option because I'm trying to think here, guys that are definitely. Uh, not coming back, right? Tyler Perry for sure gone. He doesn't have eligibility left. Uh, is Will McNair, Will McNair. out Will of McNair. it? I think. Um, yeah. There's so, two, and Naquan Tomlin spot that they never filled. So that's yeah. that's at least three transfers that you have to do. But you are bringing in David Castillo, so then you're back down to two. Yeah, you, you but then you have to think about okay, Qu- Quez Glover could maybe get a medical hardship. I think, but I think they want- would like. I think they they would like that just because okay. it's a ball handler. It's a yeah. guy that's got. Uh, but I, I don't think Arthur Kalum is coming back. So um, in a way, you're going to be forced into going to the portal at least three times, probably four or five. Yeah, yeah. I honestly, based on how the numbers work out, and just okay, we assume that these guys are probably gone. Then you know you're probably hoping that it's five because th- there are guys and like I, I won't name them because everybody knows, but like there are guys wasting spots on this roster. So it would it, you'd ideally hope K State has five spots they have to fill this season. Now, like perfect world, you don't have that many spots you have to fill, but that comes with time and building a program and and true depth and consistency. K State just isn't there yet. It, I think it will happen, but it's tough early on with with you know, coaching changes and and trying to get things molded the way you want them. Moving on to another basketball topic, but we go to the other locker room inside of Bramlage. Women's basketball was in the middle of a fantastic season. They shot up to number two in the rankings, but then Aoka Lee got hurt. They were able to do well without her for a little bit. They got the big win at home against KU. They were able to go on the road and beat Baylor, come from behind in that game. That was impressive, but it feels like it started to catch up to them. She tried to come back against Iowa State, then got hurt again, and then missed the game uh, over the weekend. So did Aoka Lee's injury disrupt the flow of the women's basketball season, and is it going to be possible for them to kind of capture what they had early on and get back to being a team that was playing like one of the best teams in the country? Uh, Yeah, I mean, it could be, but, I mean, unless you thought they were going undefeated, 18 or no, then I mean, something was going to catch up to them. So I'm just a little conflicted on that. Yeah, I I, I think it, it. there's no doubt that it did disrupt the season in some way because you lose your best player who in the game of women's basketball is, is near unstoppable. I mean, you, you have to have on the other side, if you're facing Aoka Lee, you have to have somebody that matches her in size and then also in some to some extent st- skill. And that's really tough for teams to do. And I think when you miss that, they did they did well enough early on there, but it takes a lot out of a team. Like what K State had to do to go win on the road without Aoka Lee against a solid Baylor team, that takes a lot. And then you think about the games that they have lost this year. They they've all been tight. They lost at Oklahoma. It was a close, tight, competitive game. They lost at Iowa State. That thing was tight and competitive. The Texas game on the road is really the only one that got away from them, but even that they battled in. So it's not like they've been so far off of it, but I think people look and you see that, you know, in the, in the women's basketball standings in the big 12. Now Oklahoma was keeping such a steady lead. Now K state is back within a game of that K state, West Virginia and Texas are just all a game back. OU still has to play Texas and they still have to go on the road to KU who is actually playing better. Now I saw KU's back onto the bubble there. So OU might get that lost. And now it just comes back to if K state is able to, to kind of regain how they played, whether they have Aoka Lee or not. The Big 12 title is still in reach for them, but I think there's no doubt that it did disrupt the season, but I think it's for different reasons. I don't think they just threw their hands over like, oh, well, we're shot. We're not going to be able to do this thing now. I think they just have to do so much because like the men's basketball team, they they lose a key guy now. I mean, it's, it's really tough sledding for them to try and, and win a game, but they lost Naquan Tomlin, who they thought they were going to have, and he hadn't even played this year, but his spot on the roster and what he can do talent-wise definitely disrupts what they wanted to do. They have to play differently. Now you're asking more out of everybody else. I think it's the same thing for the women's basketball team. Yeah, I agree. Big one, right? Uh, Wednesday night, 
tonight, if you're listening to this now, uh, is Wednesday and yeah. it's West Virginia where you're in a three-way tie with, I believe, with mm-hmm. West Virginia and Texas. You lose. It's kind of like an elimination game of sorts. Yeah, pretty much because you, you look after this. I mean, K State they, they have to go at KU, then Iowa State at home at Texas Tech. So not the easiest, but also not the hardest uh, and, stretch left in the league. And KU, a team that's starting to figure it out a little bit. They were yeah. they had higher expectations before the season, basically face planted right out of the gate. Um, starting to figure it out. They could they could play spoiler here because they play K State and I think they play Oklahoma, Oklahoma. as well. Yeah. yeah. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, all right, last one, K-State related for you. We shift to another sport, K-State baseball. They took it on the chin last night uh, at Arizona State after having a chance, leading at various points in the game. But, you know, as always in college baseball, pitching is atrocious. Yeah, that was the case last night for them. So K-State 2-2 two and two to start their season after being preseason top 25. Is this a do-or-die season for Pete Hughes as the K-State baseball coach? Because the last couple of years, they've gotten hot late. They've been just outside getting into the NCAA tournament. If they don't do it this year, uh, is it time to, to move on from Pete Hughes? Yeah, so it's a good question. What I will say is, like, doing what you did the last few years, considering the schedule in front of them, might actually get you in. So, uh I, it's not time to panic just yet. Uh, pitching failed them a little bit in Tempe, obviously. So did, you know, being walked four times in an inning, three times and only scoring a run as well. So the timely hitting wasn't there. And that stuff, you would think that's more of like a first week thing. Um, the pitching can be more of a first week thing, but considering who it was, you hope it's just the first week thing because you expect better out of Borma and neighbors, to be quite honest. So uh, I'm not hitting the panic button, but my guess is Pete Hughes is probably, as long as they don't completely fall apart, even if they miss the NCAA tournament, probably safe. I understand the question because narrowly missing it that many times in a row is, uh, you know, you you can make an argument that you're not growing, but – uh, and not playing significant baseball, and and I understand wanting a certain standard, but at Kansas, at Kansas State, when you're you're kind of in a spot when it comes to your non-revenue sports, where you're a little hamstrung financially, having a guy with the ceiling as Pete Hughes, um, and being able to afford him, and and not being concerned that he's going anywhere, I still think is a bit of a luxury. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Look, it, there's no doubt that it's frustrating, and K State does a lot of things that you, you, you tear your hair out and you say, you got to be better in this. You got to be better at making decisions and knowing how to play the game. But at the end of the day, K State, they've played baseball for over 100 years at K State. There haven't been all that many great seasons. They've made the NCAA tournament just four times. The, the ceiling for what a team in the Midwest, especially in K State's position, can be. It's not very high, and uh, while it would be nice for K-State to be in, and I think that they could get there, and I think that should be the expectation and goal, and I think the season at this point should be viewed as a failure if they don't get in this year, it's not a reason to move on from Pete Hughes because what Pete Hughes has done since getting to K-State, you know, he took over that first year after Brad Hill, they were under 500. He hasn't been below 500 since then. He's had them on the cusp of it. That's asking a lot. That, that's a lot for K State baseball relative to what they've done in the past, and not. He's also bringing in legitimate talent now to this team. Like, yeah, that, he had a first round pick in Jordan Wicks. He's got you know possibly two more with Cole Pepper and Neighbors. Like, he's got talent coming to Manhattan. It's just it takes a long time to acquire the status of which you need to get quality depth of pitching in college baseball because it's so hard to find. And until K-State gets that, they're going to play this game of bubble, maybe not. Like, it's going to take a while, but he's getting them there. Yeah. I know it's frustrating because relatively to what they have talent-wise, at least or maybe last year, year they, they had Wicks this year. It's like, well, that that probably should be enough to make the NCAA tournament. You know, th- they have some high-end guys, but it is a depth issue at times, too. So you got to yeah. remember that. Uh but that's the fact is, is like you have a coach that is at least capable of recruiting or developing talent, you know, every almost every season with high draft picks, 
even if you don't have a good enough bottom of your roster to kind of get over the top or, or you just, or they're underachieving, you make the, the case, uh, you make, you know, you decide what it is, but having a coach capable of that, I think is still a luxury for Kansas state. Yeah. And if you go and look at, at like how this thing has worked out for, for the big 12 and how they send teams to the, the NCAA tournament last year, it was Texas Tech, TCU, Oklahoma, Texas, Oklahoma State, West Virginia, all in much different geographical setups than K-State. I mean, Oklahoma is somewhat similar, but even they get a little bit of a benefit there. Plus, they're closer to, like, you know, Dallas and, and Texas in general. So that helps. And you look around, like, there's a reason why Iowa State and Colorado don't have baseball. It's because it just isn't feasible or make any sense for – their situation weather-wise and financially for the types of schools that they are. So K-State even being in this position where baseball is not even like just a rollover team that teams face at this point, I think that's a step in the right direction. It's no doubt frustrating. There are certainly things in game that I think Pete Hughes should be criticized for, but overall as for what he's done for the K-State baseball program, it's positive. And until it starts taking a serious downturn, I think you give him the opportunity to keep riding it out and keep improving this thing brick by brick, even though it may be frustrating, especially as more people pay attention to it as basketball struggles this year at K-State. Uh, we'll finish this off with one more uh, baseball-related question, but not K-State related. Uh, this was thrown in there, probably more targeted at me uh, since I'm a, a, ver a very vocal man about the Royals. But what are the thoughts on the Royals' move to downtown? Uh, look, You've been to Kauffman Stadium before, D.Y. You like when the Reds come to town, and now every other year they'll be coming to Kansas City with the new scheduling set up. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Royals moving downtown? Do you like the move or not like the move? Uh, they were going to move no matter what. So, uh, obviously, you knew they were going to stay in Truman. So, I think, you know, it's probably the best of what the options were because I don't think Missouri was going to let them get to Kansas, even though that might have been an ideal spot, putting them over in the legends. But Move you have to the Wichita. Or you have the you have the uh, you know the politics of switching states and the tax revenue going where you know what I mean. So uh, I like that they basically ditched whatever it was it the first three four downtown options. It was yeah. just horrible. Um, this one, say what you will. If you don't like a downtown stadium or want the stadium downtown for whatever reason, um, and I know there is reasons, I get it, but at least they picked the best of the, the the downtown spots that were floated out there because the first few that were floated were terrible. Um, this one, you know, it alleviates a little bit of the parking issue, at least puts it in a part where you would consider uh, a little bit more vibrant as well um, around more stuff that you're familiar with maybe too soon, but in a safer part of the Kansas City area as well. I, you know, obviously, what just happened, but that's an exception, an outlier, I think. Um, the other ones I wouldn't have considered in a better neighborhoods. Yeah. So this one I would. And and I, to be honest, I kind of like, and I know this is a weird part of it to like, that little the jet skywalk thing that they have. I think that was a great idea if that's really going to be part of the design. Uh, you're right. It's certainly the best out of the options that were thrown out there. It's kind of like, why didn't you you throw this one out there first? Uh, yeah. It makes the most sense. I like I I'm, I have nostalgia for Kauffman Stadium. I think it's great, but I, I'm not opposed to them getting a new stadium, and certainly not against downtown. Like, I think you you look at teams that have have done this. They've got awesome stadiums, and I think it's a good setup for the city. And people rave about it that have those setups. My question and concern for this has always been as somebody that obviously comes from, you know, three hours away to go to, to Royals games and how like this setup works, uh, like you have to have the infrastructure for it. I've been to Kansas City for Big 12 tournaments or even just one off K-State games. And it does seem like, you know, at times it, it can be a little difficult to, to find parking and it can get a little congested down there. So I have concerns about that and all these other ones that I've been to that have you know, downtown or in, you know, tight neighborhood stadiums, the public transportation in that city has been good. I mean, you, you, both Chicago's, it's pretty easy to get to. You, Minnesota, same type of deal. Like, it's very easy to get to because their public transportation takes you right up into left field. Kansas City, 
you can tell me, oh, look at the little street car. I don't care. That thing is a piece of crap that you can fart around on, whatever. Yeah, I think you are going to have to maybe hope that things are a little bit better there. But ultimately, I can deal with it. I'm. They're not going to do this move if there isn't options for people. I just want there to be better options. But overall, it's a good move. Uh, now, they did miss out on the renderings. I don't know what you're thinking of doing by not putting the crown scoreboard on there. I think that would be a stupid move, and I would probably – uh, try to impeach John Sherman as uh, owner of the Royals if if that ends up being the case because like j- that's more iconic than the fountains at this point. I think people just see water in the outfield they're like oh cool whatever. It's the scoreboard that makes Kauffman Stadium, so uh, that would be the thing that they need to keep over. But overall, I'm okay with it, uh, and it's probably a good thing for Kansas City. And they're I, I saw that they'll probably buy up some of the areas around it and put up their own stuff. You maybe one of those, two of those is a, a garage of some kind you would think, but the, the good thing about what I would say, the good thing about having the being on the streetcar path would be that you could technically park anywhere along the streetcar path. Then, Yeah. We'll see uh, how it ends up lo- looking and I, I'm sure it'll be fine, but it's, it's a long ways away. So I'll worry about it when, uh, I get to the point where I'm actually driving. I'm like, where the heck do I park? I'm 30 minutes away and I don't even know what I'm going to do. doesn't matter right now, though. I'll uh, enjoy Kauffman Stadium. All right, that'll do it for us. For Derek Young, I'm Mason Vo. Thanks for watching and listening to K-State Online. For more coverage of the Cats, head over to On3. Go find K-State Online and uh, plenty of good stuff over there about K-State football, basketball, recruiting news throughout the week, and uh, be sure to stay locked in right here to the K-State Online YouTube and podcast platform. So we are out of here. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.